and sir we are live we can start hello good afternoon to all welcome to today's webinar and uh, this is presented by the department of english language and literature premier university so it is one of the series of the seminars at which we brought it to life because of the pandemic situation uh, normally we would hold these uh, in our campus so uh, today we would like to introduce you with the professor mohitu lalom professor let uh, before i begin let me introduce professor mohitu lalom uh, i'm just getting through with his profile a little bit professor mohitu lalom is a Shakespearean scholar, had his PhD on Shakespeare from the University of Dhaka. He had his higher studies from Dhaka and from Lake Head University, Canada. Professor Mohitu Lalom is a renowned scholar and uh, he is also, uh, a, he, he edited Shakespeare, uh, on Shakespeare and uh, he had got 10 translations on Shakespeare's plays. He also edited Hamlet and As You Like It, which gained critical attention from over the world. Professor Mohitu Lalom retired from Chittagong University as a professor of English from the Department of English. He worked as a dean of arts faculty in the University of Liberal Arts, Dhaka. He is also the founder chair of Department of English Language and Literature, Premier University. Professor Mohitu Lalom's book, Golpe Golpe Ingreji Shekha, a great text on English learning pedagogy, has won prestigious Egushe Padok, which is a very renowned prize. He's also, he was also a regular columnist and he wrote many articles in the sports journal in the ICC World Cup of 2010 and 2011. He worked as the vice chancellor of Kobi Kadi Nozdul Islam University at Moiman Shinho Trishal from 13 to 17, 2013 to 2017. He has been the editor of a very prestigious journal named Crossing, published by University of Liberal Arts. And he is at present working as an editor of PCB, Premier Critical Perspective. At present, he is working in the capacity of the Dean of Arts and Social Science at Premier University. Now, we, I would like to give him the floor, but before I uh, get over to him, I would like to request everyone to please uh, mute your microphone. And if you do have any question, write in the chat box. After this session, we will have 20 to 25 minutes question answer session, and we will invite a few questions. I'm afraid we probably won't be able to give much time. And uh, we also would like to request you to be there in the whole session, because uh, I believe the contents that the Professor Mohitul Alam will be delivering would simply be very important. Thank you, everybody. I'm now handing over the microphone to Professor Dr. Mithul Alam. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon from this part of the world. This happens to be Chittagong, a part of Bangladesh on the Southeast coast. And the speech I am going to make on Shakespeare is mainly prompted by my intention to share the editorial problems that have been encountered by Shakespeare's editors over the centuries. 
Before I begin my speech, I would like to thank my colleague, Mr. Sadat Zaman Khan, Chairman of the Department of English Language and Literature of Premier University. And at the same time, I would like to thank Professor Onu Pomshen, Honorable Vice Chancellor of Premier University, Chittagong, for having arranged this forum for me in which I can share my views on Shakespeare with all of you. Now, uh, the editing job on Shakespeare, in my view, is a paratextual job, by which I mean that Shakespeare is a text, but at the same time, what the editors do, they supply extra information on the text in terms of footnotes, glossary, annotations, then introductions, illustrations, all this make up a present day Shakespearean text, a paratext. So this paratextuality will be very much the focus of my lecture today. But again, uh, this, this is not very unique for this modern period. Even from Shakespeare's lifetime, we can detect this conflict between Shakespeare as the stage and Shakespeare as the page. This conflict started from Shakespeare's lifetime. I will just refer to one example to make it clear. In Shakespeare's lifetime, there were two quarto editions of Hamlet. One was published in 1603 and another one was published in 1604 and 5. 1603 quarto edition of Hamlet is usually called a bad quarto, especially in 1909 when neo bibliographer, the pioneer of neo bibliography, Professor A. W. Pollard, started uh, researching on Shakespeare's folios and quartos. He identified this quarto edition of Hamlet of 1603 as a bad quarto. And then another important quarto, which was also considered a bad quarto, was the 1608 uh, version of King Leah. Now, what a bad quarto actually means is that in this text, it is mainly often the result of memorial reconstructions by the players on the stage. They just reproduced these from their memories. And a bad quarto is also identifiable by the slippages made through the text, uh, there would be missing a whole scene, a whole speech. And again, the missing links can be uh, filled up by traces from other plays. One good example will clarify this. For example, the very famous soliloquy uh, by Hamlet, to be or not to be, that is the question. It is the soliloquy uh, painted in this form in Q2 and folio 1623. But in quarter one, it goes like this. To be or not to be, I, that is the point. So all these differences therefore have made folio uh, quarter one of Hamlet as a bad quarter. But again, there is another view. The the scholars who prefer to consider Shakespeare as the stage, that is Shakespeare on, only mainly wrote for the stage, not for publication or for reading people, they think that quarter one was actually a true representation of the dramatic text. And in quarter two, we find that in, in quarter two, this is much larger than quarter one. Quarter one has only 2,154 lines. Quarter two goes about the double of this size, spreading over 3,725 lines. And in 1623, when uh, Shakespeare was already dead for seven years, two of Shakespeare's fellow actors, John Hemmings and Henry Condell, they published a complete works of Shakespeare uh, in the folio edition. This folio edition is the first folio edition of Shakespeare's uh, canon, and it is known as uh, folio 1623. In that folio, they, the 
edition they published of Hamlet was a mixture of Q1 and Q2, not Q1 ex actually, it was the theater copy of the Q1 and Q2. And what happens here is that they excluded a very popular soliloquy by Hamlet, which is the final soliloquy and which goes like this, how all occasions do inform against me. And this soliloquy was excluded from the folio edition. And when uh, in 1988, Stanley Wells and Gary Taylor published the very imposing complete works from the Oxford Shakespeare, they also excluded this soliloquy from the main body of the text of Hamlet, but printed it at the end of the play in the section called additional passages. And before that, in 1985, when Philip Edwards published uh, his edition of Hamlet from New Cambridge Shakespeare publication, he included the soliloquy, but he explained in his introduction that this soliloquy actually became redundant and Shakespeare had realized it. And when Shakespeare was preparing Q2, it, it is said that Shakespeare had direct hand on the making of the manuscript for Q2, but it is not variably true, but it is said. And Shakespeare probably had overseen the uh, proof and he uh, put instruction to get it deleted. But the compositor ignored it and it remained in Q2. And when in 1997, Stephen Greenblatt and others, they published the Norton edition of Shakespeare they basically followed or modeled their edition on the Oxford edition, which was published in 1688. They also included the soliloquy, but printed it in italics to indicate that it was not included in the Oxford edition. Oxford edition primarily wanted to focus Shakespeare as a dramatist, not as a writer for literary reading. But before that, in 1982, when Harold Jenkins published his edition of Shakespeare from the Arden Shakespeare, he included the soliloquy, how all occasions do inform against me, because he thought that Q2 was mainly overseen by Shakespeare, therefore Q2 was more authentic than the folio edition. And since I edited Hamlet in 2019, I also included this soliloquy in the right place, mainly because I was following Harold Jenkins as my base copy. Other than this, there is another debate we can also refer to how Chica this sir. editorial debates actually occur. Uh, in the same soliloquy, Hamlet says to grunt and sweat under a weary life. But the, the, that was changed to, to groan and sweat under a weary life by William Devenant in the restoration period. And the other debate that occurred was with the word salid. Hamlet says, oh, this too, too salid flesh would melt in the past soliloquy. Salid spelling in the, soli in the folio edition is S-O-L-I-D, solid, but in Q1 and Q2, the spelling is S-A-L-L-I-E-D. When John Dover Wilson published his edition of Hamlet in 1934, he changed the word to Salid, S-U-L-L-I-E-D, which is retained by Harold Jenkins. Now, what is the difference between Salid, S-U-L-L-I-E-D, and S-O-L-I-D? Salid, according to Harold Jenkins, refers to the uh, contamination of the soul by the sin committed by Hamlet's mother. So it was mainly a spiritual contamination that was suggested by the word solid. But on the other hand, he meant to say that solid only refers to the bodily contamination or physical contamination. And Greenblatt retained solid, S-O-L-I-D, in his edition of Hamlet, discussing that solid is more appropriate to indicate the contamination of the body because of the sin committed. So here you see the difference between uh, Harold Jenkins and Stephen Greenblatt is that Harold Jen Jenkins emphasized the spiritual contamination and Greenblatt emphasized the physical contamination. And again, if we go back to the folio edition, uh, Hemings and Condell, they published the, 
as prefatory note many commendatory poems contributed by many contemporary writers of the time one of the poems was contributed by ben johnson who was apparently a friend of shakespeare but at the same time he was a rival poet but in his poem he said that shakespeare was not of an age but for all time by which he indicated the universal fame and reputation that shakespeare would gain over the years now here this line actually can form the fundamental basis for the editorial principles that had to be formulated because when ben johnson said that shakespeare was a universal writer it means he acknowledged the fact that shakespeare would cross the boundary of a space and time for example in bangladesh i am reading shakespeare so it means shakespeare has crossed this barrier of time and space when such is the case it means shakespeare cannot remain in any perfect shape it is rather the more true fact that shakespeare would become a fluid author a changeable author an inexhaustibly creative author on which time and again different opinions would occur so this is the basis by which we have to understand that there is no one word now to say that this is the solid shakespeare or this is the iconic shakespeare we can get it shakespeare rather is an author who is now subject to variable interpretations variant readings and then when we go along this line if we now consider the 18th century editors along with the restoration editor william davenant we will see how this difference of opinions between the scholars of shakespeare is creating a stumbling block to actually explore shakespeare and uh, arrive at a certain uh, authorial copy i am just now going to briefly speak about the problems that have been faced by the editors of shakespeare from the restoration period down to the romantic age then after that i will pick up the new bibliographers who became very vibrant in the 20th century and at the end of my speech today i will also take up the efforts and uh, the different directions that are that are now taking place on the studies of shakespeare because of the advent of the digital humanities or the hypertext that i will come to the come to discuss in the last part of my speech now william davenant he was the actor manager of the company called duke of york's man he was patent, patented by charles the second the king who was the restored monarch 1660 is the year when monarchy was restored to england and charles the second saw to it that the companies were uh, like campaigning for the royal uh, prerogatives and the company that he gave the royal patent was um, the king's man which was originally shakespeare's own company and this company was managed by robert killigrew and the other one the duke of york's man was managed by william davenant now william davenant brought about certain basic changes to the mode of presentation on the stage of shakespeare's plays the first thing that he did was to shift the arena of performance from the open door theater or open sky theater to the closed door theater we all know that in shakespeare's time the globe stage was an open stage and the uh, platform was open on three sides even the crowds could touch the body of the actors when they were performing but uh, devin uh, william devin had brought it inside the auditorium and because of that he gained certain uh, opportunities to make the theater hall look like a tv box of today he introduced the proscenium arch which was meant to separate the audience from the performance 
and then he also introduced a space where discovery the act of discovery could take place and then he made the a stage uh, look like a perspective stage that is it could create angles for the audience from different angles so this kind of novelty was introduced by devenant for the stage craft if we refer to his macbeth for example he made macbeth a very interesting a spectacular show because he introduced the flying machines by which the witches in macbeth could fly down from the ceiling to the floor and then again uh, flew back to the ceiling so it became so uh, so ad adorable a spectacle that the witches went on coming in and going out frequently throughout the play it was great fun and in addition to this uh, devenant made another major change to the presentation mode in shakespeare's time the stage was a one sex stage but devenant changed into a two sex stage by which i mean that he introduced the women to play the female roles it is a very different kind of innovation because uh, in shakespeare's time the boy actors they all performed in the female roles the great female characters for example ophelia then desdemona then cordelia lady macbeth on the other hand rosaline here and then miranda all these great cleopatra of course all these great female characters during shakespeare's time were uh, boy actors who were picked up by the adult companies uh, when they did not go through the physical change in their boyish tone so what happens here is that uh, uh, devenant took away the pleasure uh, of the drama which was exploited by shakespeare through the device of disguise because by using the device of disguise shakespeare could exploit the pleasure of the feelings of both the both the gender the male gender and the female gender being acted out by the same character so it happened that the boy actor dipped into his female role and then he again came out to his boy's role so this very interestingly happened for example in in the merchant of venice when jessica uh, was uh, eloping with lorenzo jessica changed her dress from being a woman into a man then he she says or he says because she was a boy actor he says that i am happy that you don't see me because it is night otherwise if you had looked at me you would be i would be embarrassed to show my exchange exchange means change of dress so you see this boy actor was uh, originally the boy actor he was performing as jessica then jessica has taken the disguise of a boy and uh, she therefore says that i am now embarrassed to show my thighs though she was a woman and again in in antony and cleopatra cleopatra says that uh in the last scene when she would be uh, arrested by uh, octavius caesar she says to the labella to iras and charmia to her maids would you like to be buried in rome this is the only instance where boy the noun is used as a verb why is cleopatra referring to this fact because whoever would be performing as cleopatra Peter knew that he would be a boy that is why she is using the word boy then in as you like it for example uh, rosaline says to celia when celia was not revealing the name of polander to her rosaline was impatient and then rosaline says do you think because i am a caparison caparison means tired like a man that the double uh, doublet and hose are in my disposition that is do you think my change as ganimed has changed my inner being as a woman so this very idea where shakespeare used or treated disguise not 
as a means to an end, but as an end in itself, this very opportunity was taken away when uh, Devanan introduced women to actually perform in the female roles. But then, you see, uh, we have to credit Devanan for the fact that the first women that he introduced on the stage was Anne Marshall. Anne Marshall in, in his 1661 production of Othello, and Marshall performed in the role of Desdemona. Then Anne Marshall was followed by a long line of talented female actresses, like uh, Lady Betterton, who was the wife of uh, Betterton. Then uh, Grace Gardel was there. Hannah Pritchard was there. Hannah Pritchard was interesting because she appeared with uh, the famous thespian of the time, David Garrick. And David Garrick was short statured. So when they were playing the roles of Macbeth and Lady Macbeth, it provided great amusement to the audience because Hannah Pritchard was taller than David Garrick. That is Lady Macbeth was taller than Macbeth. You know, physical size matters. As you know, in, a, in Amir Saman Ice Gym, Helena and Harmia, when they quarrel, one of the reasons they were quarrel, quarreling was about their physical features. Helena was taller and Hania was shorter. So here, then uh, Hannah Pritchard was there. Sarah Sheedons, she was also a very talented actress. She is the first actress who performed the role of Lady Macbeth as a soft-spoken, empathetic character. But against her, when the next actress would come, Ellen Terry, she almost occupied the stage, the, proving herself as an invincible, cruel, hard-hearted, Woman. And apart from this, Devanan did not stop there. He also th thought that Shakespeare should be contemporized. Even his colleague, contemporary Dryden, also felt the same way. Dryden, though he was one of the greatest admirers of Shakespeare, Dryden said in one of his essays that because Shakespeare was excessively fond of wordplay, puns, all these rhetorical figures, he used so much that which has become redundant for the readers of the restoration period. So therefore Dryden thought that not only Shakespeare, both Chaucer and Shakespeare should be modernized. And Devenant was along that line. But look at the courage of Devenant. You know, the famous soliloquy again, to be or not to be, that is the, that is the question. And I will just read the passage, last passage from Hamlet's soliloquy and the change that uh, Devanan brought over. Hamlet's soliloquy in the original copy goes like this. Thus conscience does make cowards of us all and thus the native hue of resolution is sickly over with the pale cast of thought. And now listen to Devanan's rendering or putting it into his own language. Thus conscience does make cowards, and thus the helpful face of resolution shows sick and pale with thought. So you see where Shakespeare got native view of resolution, which is a powerful expression to express Hamlet's agony, and Devenant softens it down to this expression, helpful face of resolution. From a negative dimension, it takes on a positive dimension because probably Devenant did not want to dissatisfy his audience, as he did with that famous line, to, to grant and sweat under a weary uh, life. He said, to grant and groan, to groan and sweat under a weary life. And then Macbeth. Macbeth is a very good example how politics comes into play in editing Shakespeare. This is one point even that has worked in my case also. When I was uh, dealing with Hamlet, I could see that some political situations I have to care, bear in my mind. Even as Stephen Dindlatt has said, that Shakespeare was very diplomatic, very crafty in a sense that he knew how to avoid being arrested by the hand of law. All other great contemporaries of Shakespeare, uh, Thomas Kidd, uh, Christopher Marlowe, Ben Johnson even, even the essayist uh, Francis Bacon, they were interned in jail uh, at least one time in their lives. 
but it is only Shakespeare who could save his skin. Similarly, Devenant also was very alert about the priorities of his king, Charles II. So you know what happens here when he was going to present Macbeth. Macbeth is a clear-cut regicide. He is a king killer. But Charles II's father, Charles I, was also executed by the colonial forces in 1649. So it was impossible for Devon and to, you know, to put Macbeth uh, with the heroic stature which is enjoyed by him in the original Macbeth. So what he does, you know, he tries to reduce Macbeth's heroic image from that of a tragic hero into a repentant hero by making him look like Oliver Cromwell rather than Shakespeare's Macbeth. And at the same time, he elevates Malcolm's character from this subdued character which he is in Shakespeare's Macbeth to a great hero as if he is equivalent to Charles II. So the similarity is very striking. Uh, Malcolm is going to be restored to the throne of Scotland and Richard, uh, Charles II is going to be restored to the throne of England. So this is how they went through this specifying line so that the authority does not get disgruntled with them. And what happens, you see, in Shakespeare's Macbeth, in the original copy, when Macduff faces him and Mac Macbeth comes to know that Macduff was not of woman born because he was extracted out of his mother's womb by surgery, Macbeth is disillusioned then he realizes that he has been cheated by the witches for all this line, uh, all this time. But then he doesn't give up. He says that I will fight with the harness on my back and I will fight it out. So there is no word of repentance when Macbeth dies. He just dies. But in Devenant's uh, rendering of Macbeth, he gives Macbeth a passage in which Macbeth says, Oh, I have to bid farewell to this great world. But you see, most of the, most of all, I despise the thing called ambition. Oh, ambition, you have killed me. So this kind of repentant Macbeth, therefore, is the outcome that we find in Devenant's production of Macbeth. But this very strong uh, poetic justice, which has been imposed by Devenant, has continued in English editorial policies for the next 200 years. Not only Devon and Alexander Pope, then uh, Nicholas Doe, Theobald, uh, then uh, Samuel Johnson, Edward Capel, all these great editors, 18th century editors, followed this morality pattern, which was set by Devon. That is why uh, this great critic, Jonathan Bate, a modern critic, has said that if we study the psychology of these 18th century editors, we can detect that there is a reactive mode in their presentation of Shakespeare, both in textual works and also in critical works. What is this reactive mode? By this reactive mode, he meant to understand that they responded Shakespeare in a reaction as if Shakespeare needed to, needed to be improved upon. So Devenant felt that Shakespeare should be contemporized. Dryden also felt the same thing. Capel also felt, felt the same thing. Nicholas Rowe also felt the same thing. So this reactive mode did a lot of harm in uh, presenting Shakespeare as he should have been presented. But at the same time, as critic Andrew Murphy has beautifully said, that he refers to Edward Capel and Edward in his introduction to Shakespeare's complete volumes, which he published in 1668, Edward Keppel said that, I, I am reminded of a bird called ostrich. What does the ostrich do? The ostrich lays eggs and never takes care of hatching the eggs. He, she, she leaves it to the elements of nature. Similarly, Keppel said that Shakespeare, the man of genius, he also never cared to take care of the place that he was uh, writing. And Samuel Johnson was annoyed with Shakespeare in a way because Shakespeare, this great genius of future, never really cared for retaining his name in the hearts of the success, successive generations. And Greenblatt has said very ruefully that it is impossible 
to find even any handwriting by Shakespeare. There is no prompt book. There is no fair copy. Only the 18 quarters that that were available to the folio editors. So therefore, uh, Greenblatt says that though in Shakespeare's sonnets there is a kind of aspiration to remain immortal. You know, many of the sonnets just speak about immortality, how to remain immortal. But that immortality, that thought of immort um, immortality never gets extended to Shakespeare's plays. That really puts the editors into the dark regarding taking up Shakespeare, the challenge of Shakespeare, so that he can be presented to the readers in a uh, malleable form. So uh, after this, uh, Nicholas Rowe, I would mention because Nicholas Rowe also introduced certain in innovations in his editing, which are still respected today. What he did was to introduce the list of characters, dramatis personae, to each of Shakespeare's plays. Before that, in the folio edition, only seven plays were given this uh, dramatis personae list, but that was not at the beginning, but at the end. But Nicholas Doe made it a regular thing that every play was introduced by this list of characters. Secondly, he divided the plays into scenes, acts and scenes. This also he did. And further, he also gave, tried to give a locational description. You know, many of the Shakespearean scenes in the original came without any reference to the locations. But now in today's version, it is almost mandatory to give a brief description of the setting of the scene. And this was introduced by Nicholas Rowe. And then Nicholas Rowe further, he modernized Shakespeare's spellings and punctuations. So one thing here we have to note is that William Devenant, Alexander Pope, Nicholas Rowe, all of them wanted to contemporize Shakespeare to suit to the restoration period as well as to the 18th century audience. But Louis Theobald was different. Louis Theobald almost took Shakespeare as a text which should be helped, assisted by paraphrases, by annotations, by glossaries, by footnotes. And he wanted to take Shakespeare back to his age. So in a way, uh, Theobald therefore started a different line of editing. And he was a very widely read uh, reader. And Alexander Pope, a word about him. Alexander Pope was very much distrustful of the first folio edition, 1623. Why? Because Alexander Pope thought that this very famous edition was prepared by a pair of actors, John Hemmings and uh, Henry Condell. Who are they? They are only players. Do they have the intellectual ability to judge uh, the sublime quality of Shakespeare's works? So therefore, Pope was fundamentally an anti-theatrical man. And therefore, he depended on the quarto versions of Shakespeare's plays. But I must tell you that Pope probably overdid his uh, business of editing. Uh, he was himself a poet in his own right. Uh, therefore, he, I can say, was rather autocratic, uh, more autocratic than objective. And later on, Warburton said that both uh, Devenant and Pope, they wanted to rescue Shakespeare from oblivion, but they actually killed Shakespeare because they extended the wounds, the corruptions, the imperfections that were latent to Shakespeare's place. So in this way, it goes. But uh, then one okay. critic we have to isolate as fundamentally the pioneer who showed the path for the 20th century editors is Edward, Edmund Malone. Edmund Malone was an Irish editor. And he, he comes on the scene as the last important editor of the line of editors I have mentioned here. Edmund Mellon was very much dependent on the authority of the text. So the textual authority, the materiality of the text, which is so much valued in modern day editing business, 
was actually set up by Edmund Malone. And Malone said in his uh, preface, beautiful language, I am not quoting it because it's a long excerpt. Malone said that I have collated and compared all the versions of the different editions, not one time, not two times, innumerable times. And, and, and I made somebody read it out to me so that I could detect every mistake that took place in punctuation or in spelling or in lineation or in sin division. So Edward Mellon, therefore, I can say that he is the pioneer to set up the modern uh, trend of editing Shakespeare. Or before that, I would also like to mention Alexander Pope's rejection of the Porter scene from Macbeth. He said, this Porter scene is not really of uh, aesthetic value. So he cut it out, he rejected it. He thought that it was an intrusion by the players. But one interesting thing is that if we now follow Alexander Pope and omit the Porter scene from Macbeth, then we would not be able to value the great essay written by uh, De Quincey, Thomas De Quincey in the Twentix age when he wrote a beautiful essay highlighting the very good quality of the Porter scene. And the article goes with the name uh, on the knocking at the gate of Macbeth. So this essay would have lost its appeal if we ha had followed Pope's editorship. Now, after Mellon, the uh, Shakespearean editorship then comes in the hands of, I have already mentioned A.W. Pollard, who pioneered this bibliographical study in 1909. A.W. Pollard then was followed by W.W. W. Gregg, uh, who published mainly in 1942 and then in 1951 and then in 1955, all these texts where he discusses the problem of editing Shakespeare. He is the uh, editor who could find out the passages which were the result of memorial reconstruction by the players. So W.W. W. Greg and is then followed by Fredson Bowers. Of this people, Fredson Bowers is the most insistent on finding out the true authentic Shakespeare based on the materiality of the text. He said very con convincingly, if there is a clash between the bibliographical fact and the critical judgment, then the critical judgment should be sacrificed. There should not be any compromise on this point. No point should be give, given priority, which is the result of an opinion. So opinions, according to Fredson Bowers, are subjective thing. And therefore, Fredson Bowers is the most insistent uh, bibliographer who stressed the point that whatever the text says, it has to be respected. And this actually is a source of disappointment for critical reading of Shakespeare, for the uh, critical studies of Shakespeare, those who want to get along with the great, you know, mental sword that Shakespeare is, they cannot identify this Shakespeare when they too much place their focus on the textuality of the plays. So I can refer to A.C. Swinburne. Swinburne, uh, in his time, the important bibliographer was Carnival. Carnival was very, you know, painstakingly uh, like a mathematician, like a scientist, he was counting how many pauses are here, how many commas are there, how many dashes are here, all these external things, which according to W.W. W. Gray were accidentals. These accidentals became a very obsessive thing for many of the editors of the time. And A.C. Swinburne was so disgusted with this trend. He once said that all this competition, all this tabulation, all this math mathematical figuring out would not help the reader to go one inch closer to understand the great mystery that Shakespeare is. He said the great music, which is indivisible, that music cannot be comprehended by a reader when he goes through this you know, statistical approach to appreciate Shakespeare. And John Drakakis, a very modern uh, 
postmodern is actually john dakakis though he is also a very sound textual critic he has uh, ventilated his frustration with the new, new bibliographers saying that they are almost taking shakespeare to an impossible height which where shakespeare does not actually exist or cannot exist then he said it is a futile chase to find an authentic shakespeare or authentic author in the name of shakespeare after ronald barthes had published his essay the death of the author after that essay according to john jakakis there is no point no use to try to chase a mirage in the name of the perfect shakespeare even john jakakis is unhappy with green blood you know the new historicist because green blood in his book which is the biography of shakespeare will in the world a wonderful book a magical book i mean a phenomenal reading but john jakakis says that green blood has said that shakespeare referred to the dolphin on which the uh, titania was uh, sitting this reference shakespeare probably drew from his real life experience when he was a child and taken to a show to where elizabeth was traveling at that time and probably uh, elizabeth was honored with a spectacle where a big dolphin was you know structured and all the dolphin the image of the queen was there now dracakis wants to question is there any evidence that shakespeare ever went along with his father to uh, see that show and do we know anything about it so here therefore he thinks that uh, greenblatt has depended much on maybe perhaps might like this but my uh, my reaction to drakakis's uh, opinion is that if we read green blood you you will be charmed by the adroitness and the perspicuity and the insight he can actually contribute to shakespeare reading so many of the correlations that he tries to establish between shakespeare's plays and shakespeare as he was in real life seem to be almost you know uh, tangential almost palpable almost believable so that very critical ability is uh, denied if we think that uh, nothing can be established about, about shakespeare because we did not live in his time we don't know anything about it if that is the approach then we will never be able to find who shakespeare was but there was a man called shakespeare then margareta de gracia margareta de gracia Uh, a modern bibliographer and she in his uh, in her book shakespeare verbatim she praised edmund malone as creating the water shade in editing in the editing business of shakespeare and at the same time she said since uh, shakespeare almost because of the bibliographical study shakespeare almost threatened to be a non authorial person now it is therefore our duty to come back to the idea which was also propagated by ben jonson in that famous poem ben jonson said a good poet is ma- made and also born which means a poet may be a genius but at the same time he must be hard working you know that ben jonson actually regretted the fact that shakespeare was such a spontaneous dramatist he never cared to go uh, through his lines again or revise his scenes but margareta de, de, de gracia wants to establish the fact also greenblatt said this same thing that actually shakespeare did more revising than it is thought of and now they are uh, uh, framing a critical concept which can be known as a revising shakespeare that is shakespeare has formed a one man committee by which he probably had gone through many of the scenes and stephen orgel also supports this view that it is impossible to imagine that shakespeare always write like the like the soliloquy to be or not to be that is the question it is impossible for any writer who, who is a human being always to write in that always to maintain this sublime grade or quality so shakespeare might have also done or written badly also which he had rejected and greenblatt also says that he was a human being 
so mistakes you know revisions these are very common to any writer and for that reason they they think that in order to save shakespeare from this non authorial charges we should rather accept the fact that shakespeare also is a revising shakespeare now finally i have come to my final segment of the speech the advent of the digital humanities or digital age has almost cracked it open until now the editors almost acted like guardians they spoon fed the uh, readers as greenblatt has said shakespeare can never be read in an unmediated way he has to be mediated that is a, an editor has to be in the middle between shakespeare and the reader to make it digestible to him so this is spoon food is spoon feeding is suddenly gone when this uh, hyper text or electronic text or this digital websites have opened up up now the reader can go to have access to as many digital uh, you know facilities as possible he can view the banquet scene from macbeth in as many as 20 film shots he can also go to the you know reading the literary literary uh, passages on it so in this way the reader by in this present age in this you know post modern age the reader can also become quasi editor so thereby the editorial business is slightly challenged by this continuous exploration and flourishing of the electronic uh, civilization and the digit- digital archive is so rich if you now go to any uh, text by shakespeare you will be astounded to see that there are thousands of open open op- uh, opportunities for you to correlate to collate to cross check so it means the reader can become a professor by his own efforts on shakespeare so my uh, conclusion therefore would be to say that we probably would not uh, entertain the idea that a solid iconic fixed perfect shakespeare is now ever be able to get hold of but we should rather give importance to the fact that shakespeare is not any more a project which can be completed shakespeare rather is an ongoing process so this process versus pro- project this uh, conflict Uh, is there and we have to say that shakespeare is an ongoing process but then the last question if shakespeare is all, all that malleable all that change, changeable then where does his core the core shakespeare reside this question is there and my answer to this question is that there is a way if we read shakespeare thoroughly we will be able to see which language is shakespeare's own which phrasing is shakespeare's own which punctuation is shakespeare shown and which is uh, added by the editors it is it is quite easy to understand but we have to read shakespeare thoroughly in order to get to that kind of conclusion so what i mean to say is that it is never to be suspected that uh, to be or not to be that is the question was ever written by anybody else in macbeth for example hell uh, he gets this speech uh, which is rendered in uh, uh a uh, trot yeah which is iambic tetrameter uh, which is trochaic tetrameter which is rendered in trochaic tetrameter it is it was thought that it was uh, contributed by thomas middleton but as modern scholarship has grown now they can now see that it was also written by shakespeare only the song that is that appears in that scene comes from uh, middleton's play the witch so in this way you see because of this advent of the digital facilities it has become easier to understand how many times did shakespeare use the word india or how many times did he use the word usurpation or how many times did he actually mention revenge all this calculation is now easier to get onto but shakespeare the core shakespeare the wonderful shakespeare the magical shakespeare as ben johnson said he is for all time that remains true thank you very much uh, for bearing with me uh, thank you thank you very much sir uh, such a wonderful and insightful presentation and i have seen a few comments uh, 
that uh, Jainab has written, thoroughly enjoyed the insightfulness of the session. Uh, Odum Sir praised that, a brilliant presentation by Professor uh, Alam. And uh, we also find that Shantanu Das has commented, a very enlightening session. Uh, Shongita Madam has written thoroughly, enjoying the talk, and thank you so much. All right. Uh, thank you, Madam, and thank you, Arun, sir, for your participation have really uh, given an added value to this uh, wonderful webinar. So it's, it's, it's a, uh, we, we also enjoyed that uh, you had been here all the way through, and it's a privilege as well. So uh, I would like to invite, if you have any questions, but before I would like to invite the question, I personally want to ask a question to Professor Mohitul Alam. Uh, sir, if you please tell that uh, uh, you had been to USA and you personally met Professor Greenblatt yes, yes. At, at Harvard University. Now, how, how did you find uh, Greenblatt? I mean, did you find that Greenblatt was uh, taking Shakespeare uh, as someone who is as fluid as you say, could be interpret, uh, could could be uh, could be interpret in many a multifarious way. As you said, that in the digital age, yeah. even the reader can be an editor in his own terms. Mm -hmm. So, uh, how, how did you find Greenblatt expressing? Actually, I uh, met Greenblatt in 2018 on 15 March. The ideas of March, you know, Julius Caesar was killed on the ideas of March, but there was no killing. He was the simplest professor I have ever met. And my confirmation about that simple people, wise people are very modest. He is like that. He presented me with a copy of uh, Shakespeare from Norton Big Fair. And then uh, I invited him to come to Bangladesh. He said he was busy, things like that. Wonderful. About Greenblatt, is, it is that whatever you read by him, you will be thrilled. Uh, I mean, he called Shakespeare a phenomenon. And in my opinion, he is also a phenomenon. Insight is there and connections. Uh, this references, apt references, easily come to him. And I, I, I go to him that whenever I read his uh, books, I become like a butterfly drawn to the flower like that. And uh, he's, a, he's a noble man. He is the highest uh, ranking professor at Harvard. And um, he also knows how to be, how to simplify matters, you see. The other day I wrote to him about this point that in Macbeth, you see Lady Macbeth says that I would take out the uh, suckling baby from my breast and dash it to death. But there is no evidence that Lady Macbeth had ever married. But in, in Shakespeare's time, in the Elizabethan period, the convention was that wives from the royal class or higher class, upper class, they did not suckle their own babies. And the, the milking was done by the midwives, okay? And I asked him, did Lady Macbeth follow that tradition that the moment, or otherwise, how would she get into that experience? And Greenblatt answered it very beautifully, saying that these are fascinating questions. And he said, though it is not within my pay order, you know, pay order means he is not a professor to know about the Scottish history in the 11th century. So, or no, no, he was not the professor to know about this convention, practice of milking children by the mother. So he said, it is beyond my pay order. Yeah. Uh, sir, you yourself edited Shakespeare, Hamlet. And yeah. uh, as you mentioned, you uh, read it, you, you talked about a number of, you talked about Nicholas Rowe, you talked about Theobald, and uh, some of the critic, uh, you, you talked about Bade. As you read all the critics, and you yourself had been undertaking the editorial work, what are the kind of challenges that oh, you see. found? You, you see, uh, in Bangladesh, for an editor of Shakespeare, the work uh, is is very basic. You have 
to work at a very simple level. For example, our students, they don't understand the implication of the apostrophe sign. In Shakespeare, it is always over. O, then apostrophe E are over. You have to give over to our students. Dust, for example, D-O-S-T, dust. Dust means dust. You have to give that. Then um, uh, all, all these little, little things which are often uh, unnoticed by the Western editors because they don't understand that our students uh, may be incapable of grasping the word meanings at this simple level, they go over them. But I have to give all these interpretations because I know that our students may not be uh, able to understand all these simple things. And again, pronunciation is a big area uh, where I have supplied the actual pronunciation of many of the words. You see, this is very important. So in Bengali, I give it. Uh, so. And also, the main thing, as I said, paratextuality. Paratextuality means whenever you are reading a Shakespearean text, you have to imagine that this text was originally written for dramatic performance. So that performative aspect has to bear, has to be born by you in your mind while you are editing Shakespeare. So that is why when I was editing Hamlet, I took help from... Uh, Kenneth Branagh and other directors who gave me the idea how a certain episode was to be performed on the stage. So what I want you to understand here is that at a time there was a clear cut fiction between the mm. idea of Shakespeare as a page and Shakespeare as a stage. But now with the advent of this uh, digital facilities, now the gap is minimizing and it is now possible to look at Shakespeare as both playable and readable. I must refer to uh, David Custon, another friend of mine, who wrote a book in 1983 called Shakespeare the Book. He actually emphasized the fact that many of the manuscripts that Shakespeare produced were too long for the stage to be exhausted in two and a half hours. Probably Shakespeare had it in his mind that his plays would be used as reading material. And Greenblatt said that these are called Shakespeare's generous texts. That is Shakespeare was more generous uh, to supply the material to the players so that they could always find much more than they would like to have. And these additional things would be read by the readers. Then I must also refer to uh, Lucas Arne, one very influential critic who introduced the idea that Shakespeare was actually not for the stage, but Shakespeare is actually for the library, for the private reading. And Lucas Arne then uh, finds out little, little words from Shakespeare. And she says that uh, this, this, these markers are not necessary for the performers. Shakespeare must have given these markers thinking that or anticipating that there will be readers for his plays. And uh, this trend is also very much, um, but it is also at the same time uh, uh, not very a strong point to hold on to because actually Shakespeare originally wrote for the stage. Sir, uh, Arun sir has a question right here. Uh, Arun sir, uh, old professor, Dr. Arun Mulga, uh, he told new generation is almost unknown. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, he also told that critics like Bradley and Wilson Knight. So uh, mm -hmm. I think uh, uh, they are uh, some of the very important critics. So, Professor Alum, how much do you recommend them to your students? Okay. Uh, you see, G. Wilson Knight, they belong to the critical studies of Shakespeare. Today, I mainly discussed the textual editors, okay? In the critical studies, G. Wilson Knight, uh, L.C. Knight, A.C. Bradley, all of them are great stalwarts. So, what we have to do here, it's a very good question. What we have to do in our studies of Shakespeare, we have to blend these textual studies with the critical studies. This is what I am now 
pointing at that it is not possible uh, to blend these two uh, stream of studies, which at one point were taken to be different streams of studies. So therefore, G. Wilson Knight, H.T. Bradley, or even in the modern time, Stephen Greenblatt himself, or any, any great critical scholar, they would be also judged of course, they have to be very accurate in referring to Shakespearean text uh, correctly. This is what actually is the demand of the textual critics. Uh, I must uh, refer to uh, Brown Muller, who has edited Macbeth for New Cambridge Shakespeare. Brown Muller has done something innovative. In his uh, editing, he has said that there are certain words which actually Shakespeare uses as the cue for the next actor to speak or the next actor to take on an expression on his face. For example, just one example. When Lady Macbeth says to Macbeth, why are you looking so read? Okay, it means the actor is being asked. It is a cue for the actor to look or read so that Lady Macbeth can say, you should not look or read. Because you are looking like a book. Everybody can read your mind, change your mind, change your face. So this was actually a cue. In the past, before Brown Muller discovered this, in the past, it was always an inalienable, inalienable part of the text. But now it has been discovered that all these little, little markers were used by Shakespeare because, you know, they didn't have this prompt to be ready like that. And all the performers performed from their memories. So therefore, these cues were very important. You remember in Amit Saman Nice Dream, for example, when uh, Flute was speaking a line, then Queen says, hey, this is not your turn. This is a cue for bottom. So he, he misunderstood it. As you know, Shakespeare in this play has exploited the ignorance of the people who don't have much idea about theatrical stage step and how they look at this performance thing. Good question. Thank you, Professor uh, Arun, for your very good question. Sir, uh, thank you very much. And I think uh, uh, yeah, we almost uh, had a long session here. Uh, I thank you all once again. Uh, unfortunately, I will not be able to take any question. And I found that there is no, no, I am either. I, I am so ready, we can I am ready really, to answer. Uh, finish the session. Ready, I am ready to answer if you allow me. <laughs> if, if, if there is, if, if there is any further question from the audience. Yeah, yeah. Why not? Let us share Shakespeare, okay? Sir, uh, I have a question, sir. Yeah. Uh, sir, um, as you have already said, that Shakespeare's. Uh, uh, texts were actually not for stage but for library for reading. So uh, why those uh, dramas or why those uh, plays were very much famous during his time? Why they uh, were appreciated during his time? How people enjoyed his plays during his time? Okay, he... okay, okay. Good question. But you see, in Shakespeare's time, there were only eighteen quarters of Shakespeare's plays. Okay, many of them were popular because at that time. The theatrical performance was the main source of entertainment. People didn't read much. In Shakespeare's time, reading and writing quality for the common people, the standard was very low. They came to the theater. Theater was the major source of entertainment. But yet then, two of Shakespeare's poems, uh, Venus and Adonis, and The Rape of Lucrece, which he published in 1593 and 1594, during the time when plague stopped the theatrical activities, those uh, versions, uh, those poems made a number of editions. So the poetry was more popular than the plays. And, and before 1600, many of the plays written by Shakespeare even did not carry his name because it was the theatrical activities was a dream world. It was a, they, they used to call the company as a guild. Everybody participated. Don't think that Shakespeare gave a manuscript and it was literally followed word for word. No, it was not like that. If, for example, uh, 
uh, Richard Barbage, if he thought that some changes are needed, he would do it without seeking permission from Shakespeare. <laughs> it was like that because it was a teamwork. They somehow wanted to, you know, get the money from the people by presenting something in the name of Shakespeare. Shakespeare was getting popularity by the beginning of the 17th century. But before that, Ben Johnson was more popular. You see, Shakespeare had to go through this comp competitive curve. Not always that he was very good. But mainly the company, they decided, and these decisions are spread over not only Shakespeare's manuscript, over everything, whether a scene should be there, whether it should be uh, uh, taken out, or whether it should be added. All this decision was, uh, in a way, a community decision. That is another point of uh, pain for us. It is actually we loathe, we loathe to think that our great Shakespeare was a writer who could be shared by others, his fellow uh, actors. So Shakespeare was a shared element. But you see, our sense of uh, invincibility regarding Shakespeare is so strong that it is very hard for us to digest the fact that this Shakespeare was not one Shakespeare. There had been many others contributing continuously. Thank you. Good question. Sir, Arun sir. Sir, sir wants to talk to you, sir. I think your network is uh, creating a little bit of background sound. Mine? Yes. And uh, that's what it is. Called. And I would like to uh, give floor to Arun sir. Arun sir would like to. Professor Alam, you were talking about Shakespeare giving clues. And I, I, I remember uh, those uh, lines from Romeo and Juliet, where in Act 1, Scene 1 or Scene 2, uh, uh, Romeo is uh, defining love. Love is a smoke made with the fume of size, being first a fire sparkling in lover's eyes. Actually, that is a clue to the, that is the summary of the entire, I mean, on the one hand, he's defining, but on the other hand, he's telling yeah. what is going to happen. Yeah. So it is a kind of, we talk to this. Yeah, yeah. It, it is a kind of a stitch technique, which was embedded in the language itself. Shakespeare did it quite frequently, not only Shakespeare, Ben Johnson also did it. They all were very skilled in using the language for dramatic purposes, external purposes. Thank you. Sir, sir this is... Yes. Uh, is there anyone else? To me. Sir, if you want to ask questions, you can unmute yourself. Oh. I think uh, I think that's all for today. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I think this insightful discussion on Shakespeare will continue because Shakespeare never ends. We won't be able to exhaust Shakespeare. So therefore, therefore it will continue and we will be uh, hosting, Premier University will be hosting many more sessions like this on Shakespeare and his contemporaries. Thank you very much, uh, all of you. Um, see you and stay safe. Bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. Thank you, everyone. You are our living Shakespeare, sir. Ha, 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 ha.